anyway, this is the story of characters of Fitzrovia, and um, as a long-standing resident of Fitzrovia, I am just so thrilled that you have brought the true spirit of the best of Fitzrovia with your gallery, TJ Bolting. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how you found the building. I came to see Josh Lilly when he opened in 2009, and I didn't really know Fitzrovia at all. We were in Shoreditch for many years, and I just felt instantly at home when I started kind of walking around, I went to the park, it just felt like an amazing area. And I just started walking around and looking at places and then I saw a sign outside TJ Bolting and I really didn't think that it was a, a gallery space but I just thought what an amazing building and I was purely being nosy and I called up the estate agent and I said can I go inside and then by pure chance it was a perfect gallery space. Hannah, that, that's amazing, because that's like me. I came here to deliver a print in 1987 or something, and the same thing, I saw a space room and rang up the guy and it was done. But um, we're standing now in the Fitzrovia Chapel, of which you are a trustee, but also you have curated this extraordinary exhibition. Um, I really um, want to congratulate you. I think it's one of the most exciting exhibitions I've seen. Certainly, I think the best exhibition in London at the moment. And the vision to put it in this incredible chapel. I mean, Lee Bowery would have loved you. Did you ever know Lee Bowery? No, I didn't, no. I wish, I keep thinking, I wish I had known Top Aussie, top Aussie he was. Aussie. Actually, do you know I met him? I met him back in the day at a club. Yes, he was like really lovely. I don't know if he knew I was Australian, but yeah, we embraced. But Did you know he was Australian? Yes, yes. I don't, we kind of came out and so we had a hug. Okay. I, I don't know, not in one of the... Maybe he was wearing a spotty thing. But listen, how did this show come about? It's so wonderful. It came about when I heard that he had died in the Middlesex Hospital. And we often do exhibitions that relate to the history of the hospital because the chapel is the only remaining part of the hospital. And the Middlesex was famous because it had the first AIDS ward in London, so that's often something that we tap into. And when I heard that Lee had died here, I just thought, okay, this is a fabulous opportunity to bring his life, his creations. I've always been inspired and in awe of him. So it was a kind of selfish motive, really, just to get a chance to do something like this. But how did you know about him? How did, how did he percolate into your consciousness? Because, I mean, the club scene of the 80s, I mean, actually, it's probably useful but for people that don't know if you actually say who he was. The actually. Lee Barry was mm -hmm. a performance artist, a designer, a club figure. He had a band. He kind of spanned many worlds. He's very famous as being used in Freud's model, um, where he appeared totally different to his his personality, his persona, where he was totally naked. He was a very big, bald guy, but when he dressed up in his creations, he had these incredible costumes, which is what we have here. They were beautifully made, technically brilliant, lots of sequins, lots of drama, masks. Did he actually make them? Yes. He actually sewed them? Yeah. He was really technically skilled, and I mean, he... incredible if you think this... Beading. So the beading is made by his uh, friend Nicola Bateman, who's his really close assistant. So she was the... the and she would actually do the, yeah. the threading of the beads yeah. in the... And in the early days, the sequins were quite large because yeah. he often had quite a tight turnaround. Yeah. But then as they got through the years, he started getting smaller and smaller sequins. And then these bugle beads, the, the smallest thing. And this outfit is actually when he was using flesh as his favourite fabric. So this could actually be worn with nothing apart from this and then a merkin. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, we're talking 1980s, so that's almost 40 years ago. Yeah. And it's so, it was so avant-garde, wasn't it? I mean, and of course there was so Andrew Logan and the alternative Miss World. Did those two worlds, did Lee and Andrew Logan ever coincide? Yeah, Lee did it in the alternative Miss World in 1986. And that was when he first started, because a lot of people talk about him being an entertainer, so he had the kind of bucket on his hat, bucket on his head as a hat, and then this big kind of dress, and he was falling over, and it was quite comedy. But that was his kind of early... Um, but that was really his introduction, yeah. so he, he did start from that. Because I think Andrew Logan's another person who sort of never had his dues, particularly yeah. now in the current sexual debates, you know, he's yeah. really not been acknowledged for what he did with the alternative Miss World. Yeah. But I think this be, is beyond that, this is art. 
I mean, it transcends everything. What was Lee's background? What What was his? He He studied um, a kind of fashion in Australia, and but it was very traditional. And so then he came to London. He worked with Pearl, the corseter. So that's where he learned a lot of okay, his technical yes, training. Yes. And then he was um, he he started just experimenting with his own design. So he would spend hours and hours and hours, months, basically working on each costume, trying it, experimenting it, till he got it perfect. So he had always had a really strong idea of what he wanted. And then apart from that, it was just trying and experimenting. It just I mean it's just extra, you know I look at these all and, and just think each one is so magnificent. And just the vision to do that when you don't have much money, presumably he didn't have much money, and to actually have to scrimp and save to buy the satin and the feathers, and then just to have the courage to go out there and wear it. Yeah. And what was his audience? Who was he doing it for? His audience, I would say, he was showing off in the clubs. That's when he would think of um, presenting. So it was. A, uh, Kinky Galinky was a big night, mm -hmm. that was his big kind of stomping round and it would be like, right, we've got to present this at a certain night. Then he started going on TV, there's a costume here which is from a show called Take the Blame, he had a weekly appearance. Well, Hannah, so it's really extraordinary because these costumes could so easily have been thrown away in the 80s because of their ephemeral nature for a nightclub. So um, I think it's really full credit to you for tracking them down. I mean, quite astonishing and you must have been so amazed. Where were they? They were with Nicola Bateman, and Nicola was the person who did all of the sequining, was a very close friend of Lee, and he actually married her six months before he died. Even oh. though he was a gay man, he did marry her for several reasons. He did love her, they were very close, but also there was a sense that he did want someone to look after him and his legacy. So when he died, she took all of the costumes and she's looked after them ever since. Oh my goodness, but I mean, how, how do you store something like this? I mean, really, um, and presumably she didn't have a lot of money, you know, she couldn't pay for kind of archive storage at the V&A or something. No, she keeps them in her house and she has custom-made cupboards. Oh, but no. the, the good thing about a lot of the materials is that they were, they were man-made, they're not natural fibres, so there's not a lot of... Um, Moths? No. No. Well, having said that, this looks like pure wool embroidery. This actually, <laughs> this is different. This is this Liberty fabric called um, Cruel Work, and this was actually very expensive at the time. It was like thirty-five pounds a meter. Yeah, in the every time ten pounds, it was yeah. really fashionable. Yeah. Yeah. So this was actually the the most kind of expensive material he ever bought. But usually it was kind of polyester or kind of man-made satin, lots of sequins. Oh God. It's just, it's just amazing. And Nicola had just sort of lived with these. That must be quite amazing, you know, just living in a house with these. Yeah. Um, I mean, she has them in storage, but it's really important for her to look after them. Yeah. Because um, she it's loves them very much. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, that is so wonderful. And how did you choose what you wanted? I think the way you have curated this is so brilliant with the feathers there, like a, a, an autumn, like a holy chalice, and then these two guardian angels. It's really, I mean, it's really really brilliant how you've curated it, it. It was difficult to choose because there are so many amazing costumes and my eyes were bigger than my stomach when I first went to see her because they are so iconic and when you actually see things that you've seen in photographs for years and up close you really just think oh, I have to show that, I have to show that. But we essentially chose the ones that would look best in the chapel, so the sequins, the drama against the gold mosaic. Um, and the piece of the altarpiece, the feathers, and then the one in the organ lot, I don't know if you've seen that one, for just pure drama. I mean, rock. it's just one of the great shots. I mean, what actually, it's hard to see. What, what is the fabric of that one? That's velveteen, it's like a stretch. Yeah. And then we wear it with this uh, almost like a motorbike on underneath, and it's got a big stomach ball underneath. <laughs> I, and I think also the way you've aligned these with the altar, I think it's just really... I mean, what I admire is your restraint, because it would have been so easy to have one there and one there and one there, but you've actually, by being so restrained and thoughtful in your curation, you've actually made it a perfect, perfect exhibition with the marriage of the, of the place and, and the art. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we're, it's not a museum retrospective. That will happen, obviously, one day. Yeah, so it was Congratulations to you for doing it for us. Yeah. It's been so 
popular. Oh, has it? Has it? Already. Has it? Yeah. Has it? Oh, well, again, thank you for bringing all these people to Fitzrovia. I mean, it's really, honestly, yeah. just so wonderful what you're doing. And do you find that the spirit of Lee is Fitzrovian? I mean, it, where did he live? Did he live? He, he lived in Commercial Road in East London. Right. So that's where he often used to get all of his fabric from all the fabric shops yeah. in East London. But he died here. He died here. He died about 50 feet away from the chapel. Because one of our trustees, Rob Miller, he looked after Lee. He was a doctor on the ward. And he, um, he basically worked out where the ward was in relation to the, to the chapel. Oh, gosh. And he, and he remembers looking after Lee. And he said he was like... And, there's, it's a kind of bittersweet thing um, because obviously when you have AIDS and you die of AIDS, people always imagine these really thin. Thin, But Lee was, he said, he said to Rob, he goes, I thought when you died of AIDS, you, you lost loads of weight. I haven't, I haven't lost an ounce. And so he's still a very big guy even up to the end. Well, he did he know like you shape? Yeah. He loved life. He loved life. He loved life. He loved life. He loved eating. Um, he was always a big guy. And he he would like be, to be really you know big. what? He will be. He's up there. He's so proud of you. He would be so proud. So this is really the first acknowledgement of him, isn't it? Really. I mean, you know, in 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 the kind of art historical exhibition. Yeah, yeah. and it's it's art historical, and it's also very personal because people yeah. have been saying, "Oh, where's it going to go afterwards?" But I don't know. It just it's it's all about being here in the chapel because it's so tied in to yes. when he died. I don't think any retrospective could be better than what you've done. No. I really don't. And what about this snow leopard? <gasps> Damnation. I know, how nice. <laughs> I mean, Hannah, have you ever been tempted yes. to pop them on? Yes. Have you? Have yeah. you put them on? No, I haven't. But oh. when, when we went to meet Nicola for the first time, I went with uh, my boyfriend Biscuit, who, yeah. who created all the plinths and installed them. I was going to say, the plinths are fantastic. Yeah, As a fellow gallerist, I'm made. really impressed. Yeah. And when he walked in, he's about six foot something. And <laughs> he, he basically, Nicola took one look at him and said, she goes, oh, you're about the same size as Lee. And she just basically threw one of his, you know, dresses over his shoulder. And I just thought, oh my God, do you understand how special that is? And then Biscuit suddenly, you know, loved like, it. Absolutely like, oh loved it. Oh my God, how yeah. amazing. Yeah. How yeah. amazing. I mean, this one is just, came before, I mean we've talked about Andrew Logan and the kind of incredible costumes there, but what do you think, where do you think this came from, his ideas? What, what were his influences? For someone growing up in suburban Australia in the 70s and 80s, I mean, as I did, there's nothing, there's nothing like this. In London, I think he, as soon as he could, he came to London because he knew that that was where the exciting things yeah. were happening. Interesting he didn't go to New York. What were his feelings about America? He, he, he liked New York. It was a decision between London and New York. And then he said, after living in London, he said, I made the right decision. He did yeah. like New York, but he really loved London. Yeah. And he spent the first few months when he arrived here being the manager of Burger King. Um, just get earning money, so until he... I'm getting fed up. Loving the cheeseburger. Wow. Until he, and then he just by chance one night, he managed to go into cha-chas and then go into heaven, and then his whole life changed. He met the people that he came to London to meet. And then he thought, I'm going to make this. And was he the only one doing this? Who else was doing it? Well, it came out of the new romantics, mm. but it had that punky edge of mm. just slightly rebelling against everything. Yeah. And um, when Boy George first saw him, he was doing his packing from outer space with this blue face. Yeah. And Boy George said, oh, I've done a blue face. I know, I've done a blue yeah, face. Yeah. But then he said, oh, I looked closer. And I thought, no, this is something else. This is something different. So I don't know. I think Lee was just a true original. Yeah. I don't think anyone so nothing, did. There was no. no, it just came. No. Yeah, but I think you can kind of see that. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of, and then this, of course, is just so charming. I mean, you could see this in on the catwalk today, couldn't you? Actually, as, as a dress with this sort of Mary Cod style flowers, and yet it's beyond. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because he hasn't tried to be too sensational, and it's just actually really pretty. Yeah. But it's amazing. Yeah. And you know, the mask is always slightly disconcerting. I suppose the mask, yeah, yeah. just always having that. All mask. of these dresses have the mask, so I think that also takes them into this other place. Because if they didn't have the covered face, they wouldn't be so 
edgy or you know have that kind of yeah um, actually you're absolutely right yeah because it yes and also him physically he was you know what did he look like what was his face like um well i suppose you look at the freud paintings it was yeah yeah it was kind yeah. of chubby an aussie bloke aussie bloke yeah. <laughs> you know it looked like he'd been playing rugby if only all the rest of the aussie blokes looked like that can you imagine how gorgeous australia yeah. would be like you just land in australia and all the men are looking so gorgeous well funnily enough his nephew came to visit the show and he's oh. 19 he's called finn and he's six foot two tall blonde australian no yeah he loved it, you know, oh. he was really, he was really thrilled to be here and see Lee's work. But yeah. I just couldn't help looking at him thinking, you're very Lee, like the height, yeah, the yeah. blunders, the stature. Oh, Hannah, this is such a wonderful journey that you're on. I mean, it really is, and I feel here is the beginning, because I think it will. But as I say, I don't even, I think your choice of the chapel is so special, and that even if, you know, the V&A does it, as I'm sure they will, it nowhere could be more beautiful no. than, than here. And oh, capturing the angel room. Oh, I mean, how? How? It just, how incredible is that? I mean, the angel oh. and... Okay, so this is really interesting, isn't it? Because how many fashion designers in recent years have put angel wings on bats? And he did this 40 years ago. Yeah, 85. I mean, wow. Yeah. And I don't think I can't think of anyone who had done it before. But yeah. now you often see those designers with the wings on the back. That is such a beautiful, beautiful piece. I know, it's one of my favourites just yes. because it works perfectly with the mosaic of the chapel. Yes. And and the way you've referenced the angels up up there with yeah. the wings um, on those seraphims and cherubims. Yes. Yeah. I mean just that's just brilliant. That's the most brilliant piece of curation. Hannah, it's amazing. Um, I just want to say we are so happy having you in Fitzrovia. And just thank you for everything you have brought, because this is not the only great show you've done. And, I mean, have you loved your initial thoughts of Fitzrovia when you saw TJ mm. Bolting building? Have they been proven correct by how much you like living in the area? Yes. I mean, I, I, I don't live here, but I do live here. I mean, you I do, exactly, working here. My life here. Yeah. here. You do. Yeah, you I were do. here in two seconds this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you live here. I do live here, yeah. I'm 59 Mildly House Street, 99% of the time. Yeah, yeah. And you have an amazing toilet there. I do. Yes, yes. which we will be coming to film at some point. Okay, please do. Yes, yes, we're going to have a toilet competition. Yes. You have to come and see us. Okay, <laughs> we have one. Yeah, we have got a black and white toilet too. And I just think it's the weirdest thing. Like, the, what is it? Like, it's just two galleries in the same place have black and white toilets. Um, we can have an independent judge for which one's the best, both created by artists. <laughs> but anyway, but um, and then the, the, the placing of this one, I, again, I think Black the Angels, even though these are the two least spectacular and showy in the sense of glittery of the, of the pieces, um, I think they're profound. I mean, when I look at that, this sounds really weird, but like I think of Jura, I think of truly great, profound art. And that's not just leave, that's your curation. I think it's outstanding. 